Hello everyone, Nick the DM here, and it is finally time. After months of research, script writing, and double checking my information, triple checking it sometimes, I have finally completed my biggest project to date, my little series on demons. A few things to mention before we get into it. First, because of the absolute quantity of demon lore throughout the editions, I have split it up into separate videos. This is the main video about demons in general, then I have made one video each on the three major subtypes of demons, namely the Tanari, Oberith, and Lumara subtypes, then two more videos, one on demonic possession and one on demon roles, in whichever order I upload them, I don't really know yet. And finally, one video on a guide to demon lords. The second thing is that there is some overlap between these topics, obviously due to how tightly woven the lore is. To avoid repeating the same information in every video, I have divided as much as I thought necessary, keeping every bit of lore there was, just allocating it to whichever proper video. But I always mentioned what was necessary for each topic, so you won't be missing any major details. This is especially the case for the Tanari video, but I'll talk about that more during said video. And finally, one thing I noticed while doing all of this research is that despite the new lore presented in each edition seeming like reworks and changes, a lot of it fits together well if you look at the big picture. Yes, small details don't line up or are contradictory, but honestly, if you keep an open mind during this series, you may be able to see and understand the complete lore of demons. And with that said, let's take a dive into what nearly drove me insane like many other demonologists. Seriously, please consider subscribing, this took so much time, so strap in, this is going to be a long one. Without further ado, demons. The countless and nearly infinite realms of the Abyss hold an incredible diversity of demons. These evil denizens come in many forms with varied abilities. Some are sneaky and sly, while others are more direct and brutal. These creatures fight and manipulate each other, each striving for personal autonomy even as they seek to subjugate others. When not in conflict among themselves, demons battle various forces of good as well as the lawful evil inhabitants of the Nine Hells. The fourth edition, Monster Manual number 2, says that demons are among the oldest creatures in the universe. And at the birth of the Abyss, only a few demons existed. These demon princes were thought to be weapons of unbridled destruction, intended for no purpose other than to bring the universe under the heel of the Chained God. As the Abyss grew, its evil spread to other elemental creatures, creating demons of infinite variety and dreadful power. In their many varied forms, demons are living engines of annihilation. They embody the destructive forces of chaos. All things tend to decay into entropy, but demons exist to hurry this process along. Fear and mercy are completely alien to demon minds. Hate and savagery are their only masters, destruction their only pleasure. They do not care for plans or structure, banding together only in rampaging hordes, not full nations or true legions. Contrary to earlier editions, 4th edition claims that demons are not manipulators or schemers, nor are they tempters or bargain makers. It's said that while a demonic pr presence may turn mortals towards corruption through indirect influence, demons do not actively lure other creatures towards evil. Rather, they burn them alive or rip them to shreds. Though this conflicts with some 3rd edition and 3.5e lore we'll mainly touch on in the Demon Rolls video. Describing a single demon cannot sum up the diversity of the species, if species is even the correct term. Chaos invokes variety, so demons cannot be easily described collectively. Tulket Nor Om, author of the Black Scrolls of Om, believed all life in the universe came from the Abyss, thus extrapolating that the Abyss itself must be alive as well. Though even he never ascribed intelligence or sentience to the Abyss. Om deemed it possible that the intelligence of the demonic creatures spawned in the Abyss were in fact its own intelligence, working toward the goal of returning to chaos. 
Through their ultimately chaotic efforts, he believed that the Abyssal Fiends would bring about the Abyss's desired outcome, the end of all things mortal and immortal, and a universe that could once again live wholly without order or purpose. If Om is correct, demons manifest as extensions of the chaos and evil left in the plane after the deities, devils, and other powers had ascended to other planes and begun forging their own domains or occupying places already created out of the chaos. Spawned directly from and by the forces of chaos, there are incalculable kinds of demons in the universe, and even Om categorized the attributes of only a small percentage of them. The more this ancient scholar learned of individual demons, the more he despaired of ever quantifying their physiology. Hey, you and me both, buddy. However, this ever-growing collection of data did allow him to recognize and establish a few of their commonalities. It's strange to think that creatures spawned from chaos would have any commonalities at all, but Om had a very logical explanation for why the Abyss would abide by some vague sense of order. Demons derive from the very essence of their home plane, and the Abyss hungers for chaos and evil, using its creatures to bring more of the universe back to its ultimate starting point. Therefore, Om believed that the Abyss spawns even its most diverse demonic creations with the qualities most useful in spreading chaos and evil, as well as imbuing them with a burning desire to do so, thus creating a repetition of certain commonly found demonic traits. Though even with this knowledge, demons always remain somewhat mysterious and incomprehensible. Truly, nothing about demons seems natural to a creature from the material plane. To understand a manifestation of chaos and evil is to understand something beyond all frame of reference. Information from the 4th edition Demonomicon further supports Om's theory, stating that the violence and depravity typical of demon kind are inspired in part by a strange, semi-sentient quality that permeates the abyss. This sentience whispers in the dreams and visions of every demon calling them to dominate that dark realm layer by layer and promising ultimate power to the one demon that can conquer the abyss in its entirety. All demons respond to the abyss's calling, slaughtering, and deposing one another in endless violence. Peel away the facade of virtue, civility, and charity, and each mortal race reveals a writhing core of corruption and rage. It is said that the progenitors of demonkind were not unlike the mortal races once, but their darkness grew within them until it had warped them in body and soul. Now a demon's every thought is tainted by hatred and malice. And 5th edition also supports this line of thinking, saying that the abyss creates demons as an extension of itself, some spontaneously forming out of the filth and carnage. The Demonomicon of Iquil categorizes demons into six groupings, but makes it clear the likelihood that additional demonic races exist in the realms of the abyss still unseen by mortal eyes. These six groupings are the Lumara. The Lumara race is ancient by most mortal standards, but they are relatively recent additions to demon kind. The Lumara are immaterial creatures unrestrained by the shackles of physical bodies. They will get their own video. Oberiths. Where the Tanari embody the evil of the Abyss, the Oberiths embody its chaos. The Oberiths existed before the gods. Their forms are hideous and alien. They came from the age before ages, and the multiverse almost seems as if it would like to forget their hideous countenances. They will get their own video as well. Tanari. The current rulers of the Abyss, and certainly the most numerous of modern demon kind, the Tanari only came to be once the first mortal souls arrived in the Abyss, also receiving their own video. Next are the Created. Some powerful beings build demons from other demons, or from the raw material of the Abyss itself. These are the Created. These demons can be constructs like retrievers, undead like blood fiends, or even truly living outsiders like brood swarms. But they aren't spontaneous creations of the abyss. They are engineered, most often at the whim of a demon lord, but in some cases a powerful mortal spellcaster or outsiders like night hags. Different kinds of created demons don't share traits, each is a unique breed in and of itself. 
the witch queen Igwilv, author of the Demonomicon of Igwilv, counts quasits as created demons, theorizing that fiendish wizards created the first quasits to serve as familiars and spies. Quasits currently do spontaneously form from the abyss, but this might be an indication that once the abyss has accepted a created demon, it might adopt them into its unknowable grand designs. So, theoretically, in time, retrievers, blood fiends, and other created demons might begin to spontaneously arise as well. Then we have beasts. The abyss periodically disgorges what, in a saner realm, would be counted as beasts of the land. These demons are generally, but not always, relatively unintelligent and serve as wildfire on the abyss. The Skulvin, Abyssal Maw, Abyssal Skulker, and Abyssal Ravagers are excellent examples of demonic beasts. And finally, the least populous of the demon races, the Servitors. This category parallels the created, except that the servitors were built by entities already well-versed in the art of creating life. The gods created the servitors as proxies and agents, using the raw matter of the abyss as their building blocks. The Yoklal, servants of Lolth, are perhaps the most well-known of these demons, although others certainly exist. When a god moves on or dies, its servitors generally live on as increasingly free-willed entities. Demons like the Zovat and the Death Drinkers are good examples of demons who have outlived their creators, and yes, I will be making videos on them individually, but that'll be far, far in the future. Each type of demon, as well as the demon princes, such as Orcus and Demogorgon, have many extraordinary characteristics, including some not common amongst all kinds of demons. Demons are chaotic and evil. The smarter and stronger rule the weaker and less intelligent. The less intelligent will attack without question and fight on until slain. And this comes from Eldritch Wizardry from original D&D. Demons are native to the Abyss, a realm of unmitigated chaos and evil. They are the most violent, greedy, fickle, and perverse of the fiends. Demons come in an overwhelming variety of forms, and no one has ever catalogued them all. Demons were originally said to never willingly serve anyone or anything, though this is often contradicted in most editions and in the actions of certain demons. If forced to serve through magic or threat, they will continually seek a way to slay their master-slash-captor. Those to whom demons show a liking are typically carried off to a demon's plane to become a slave, although a favored one. Many demons, not satisfied with their own inquiry, take pleasure in tempting mortals to become as depraved as they are. Physiology Demons do not have a common ancestor, body type, or even the same needs for existence. As such, they cannot be easily described in biological terms. Some scholars even argue that demons possess no common traits beyond their origins. Om disagreed. As I mentioned earlier, he believed that the Abyss shapes demons to perform certain tasks, necessitating that its creations conform in certain ways. Unfortunately, Alm shows little evidence on that subject. Demons are notoriously difficult to study when alive, and when they die, their bodies either return immediately to the Abyss, or decay very quickly, or a number of other things we'll get into later. Nevertheless, chaos being chaos, some demonic corpses have have inexplicably remained available for study. Even the weakest of these creatures is hideous to behold. Their features are the stuff of nightmares. The most powerful of these fiends are anathema, offensive to mortal sensibilities. Their mere presence is enough to drive other creatures mad. The anatomy of demons mocks that of other life forms, and demons possess shapes as diverse as anything seen in the far realms. The ranks of the known demons represent specific forms that have stabilized in significant numbers, those that regularly appear and match others of their kind. Demons of a single named type can have radically different powers, however, and the greater mass of demons possess few common traits beyond their origin. Demons are born of the raw essence of chaos, and their wide range of features and powers reflects this chaos. Although individual demons of the same type resemble each other, this chaotic nature can manifest it in differences between them. 
One example of this can be seen in the Baldur's Gate Descent into Avernus Dice and Miscellany set, where a number of demons, namely a Quasit, Dretch, Barlgura, Hezru, and Baylor that obey Yanagu, have features similar to gnolls, rather than their typical features of their own uh, demonic heritage. Likewise, creatures tainted by demonic power can adopt a dizzying array of new abilities and twisted forms. The actual templates and themes themselves I'll cover in the videos of the respective demon lord they are named for. These can also be applied to non-demons, reflecting the way in which the abyss warps all life that dwells there. Some examples are Demogorgon's Cultist, Lolth's Chosen, and the Orcus Blood Cultist for 4th edition. Some demons can also adapt in strange ways. In the 4th edition Demonomicon, there is a section on replacing variable resistances, which explains that some demons can lose their variable resistance trait, uh, instead evolving another additional ability for their arsenal to help them in combat, like... Spell Eater, allowing a demon to tap into the raw magical energies it is infused with from its elemental origin and derive sustenance from the raw stuff of magic. This kind of demon can, once per encounter, attempt to absorb the magic from an area of an ongoing magical effect nearby, like a darkness spell, for example. If it does so, the demon can regain a use of a spent ability. Or Material Instability causing a demon to phase out of the material world for a short time, meaning that once per encounter, as a minor action, a demon could phase through solid objects like creatures or barriers until the end of its turn, and many other interesting and varied abilities, mostly uh, in 4th edition for the examples I've given. 5th edition mentions that some demons are utterly unique, while others represent uniform strains virtually identical to one another. This confirms the earlier information that we've heard. Although some sages group demons into types according to their power, the Abyss knows no such categories. Demons are spawned from the Abyss in a near-infinite variety of shapes and abilities. Basic Functions all living material plane creatures share some common elements. Creatures from humans to mind flares to dragons all eat, they all breathe, and they all reproduce in some basic biological way. Demons are not material plane creatures, as such they do not have the same needs that we expect in other living creatures. Demons in 3rd edition were classified as outsiders. Outsiders breathe, but do not need to eat or sleep, although they can do so if they wish. Uh, native outsiders must eat and sleep. Um, native outsiders are different, they're like tieflings and stuff like that. However, that was 3rd edition. The Fiendish Codex 1, Hordes of the Abyss for 3.5e, has much more detail. For eating, demons do not need to eat. That said, a demon can consume endless quantities of food of any sort, and they often take a particular joy in devouring sacrifices, especially gory or disgusting ones. Demons have even been known to consume tons of food in a single sitting with no effect or consequence, leaving much debate about where the food actually goes. The most common theory is that their link to the abyss somehow transports the food back to their home plane, but no one has yet brought forward any proof of this. This is contradictory towards some information that we will talk about in the video on Tanari demons, but that's for a later date, I'm just letting you know ahead of time. Breathing. While they must breathe, demons have extremely strong lungs built to withstand a range of environments, including the most deadly fumes of the abyss, which would kill most material plane creatures. As such, demons can easily breathe in any natural material plane atmosphere, and, the num and a number of them have adapted to be able to breathe underwater. Sleeping. Demons do not require sleep to function normally, however, powerful individuals occasionally do force them into sleep-like states, and demons can even be rendered unconscious, though not easily. A demon can choose to fall asleep, which it would normally do only for deceitful purposes, but it gains no benefit from doing so. Digestion. Even though demons can eat all the food they want, they do not have anything resembling biological digestion. The food seems to simply disappear after ingestion, unless a demon prefers to expel it somehow. If they choose, some demons can emit various kinds of discharges, such as vomit, ooze from pores, and other excretions, though not for any obvious purpose other than the joy they take in polluting their environment. Reproduction. 
Some demons can have intercourse if they choose, though not all of them have the necessary <clears throat> equipment to do so. But it is not necessary for procreation, since new demons are formed directly from the chaos of the abyss. While not necessary, it is explicitly stated as being possible in earlier editions, and that is not contradicted here, though earlier editions mention specifically the Tanari being capable of doing this, so I have a section talking about that in that video in the future. Demons that can engage in intercourse usually do so only as a means to create half-fiends, though such creatures can be created in other ways, through arcane magic or curses. From the Demonomicon of Igwilv and the 4th edition Demonomicon, quote, Demon physiology is fascinating beyond measure. I know of no other type of creature in the cosmos that so rapidly and thoroughly adapts to its environment. Take a fiery immolith and drop it in the frigid expanses of the iron wastes. Come back in a few months and you will discover the immolith's shroud of flame replaced by an aura of bitter frost. Return a few years hence, and you'll likely find a demon closer in appearance and power to a Jarlac than the creature of fire you left behind. Many, many times I have repeated this experience, each in a different abyssal layer, and all with similar results. If I locked him away for a span of years in the forest of living tongues, I wonder what form my beloved Grazd would eventually take." End quote. The common forms that are familiar to demonologists represent broad trends, but individual demons defy those tendencies. For instance, a vrock might crawl out of an oil slick in the demon web pits with three eyes and vestigial wings. A Kazme might appear on the lair of Azagrat, possessing the ability to belch forth clouds of flies. As of 4th edition, demons rarely sleep unless compelled to by magic, poison, or other external influences. Demons breathe, eat, and engage in what can loosely be called social activities. The methods and the outward reasons for these functions vary as widely as the demonic forms. Most demons eat flesh, favoring it to come from a creature that is still living while they feast. Some consume plant life, those that do often do so quickly, in great quantities, and more destructively than a swarm of locusts. Others may consume minerals or metals. Some feast off elemental energy or magic to survive. Even before sustenance or survival, a demon's highest imperative is to destroy. All other activities must serve the ultimate goal of sowing chaos and bloodshed. The seemingly endless ways of attaining that goal grant demons their equally endless differences in physiology. Demonic Life Cycle The demonic life cycle is strange to say the least, and there are many theories. Many religions believe that when evil people die, the gods punish them by consigning them to the abyss or the nine hells, or some other horrible plane populated by demons, devils, or other dark creatures. There, these evil souls undergo everlasting torment at the behest of dark powers. Some believers even claim that occasional souls rise to the ranks of demons or devils themselves, becoming slavish servants to evil. Different tomes of knowledge disagree on the finer points of these claims. The Black Scrolls of Om put forth the position that individual souls seldom, if ever, become demons incarnate, while the Demonomicon of Igwilv actually lists certain particular evil individuals from history and outlines what sort of demons they became after death. However, the Black Scrolls do allow for demonic packs and bargains. Om asserts that a particularly evil and powerful individual can make a bargain with Demogorgon or Orcus, promising to serve that prince faithfully in life in exchange for guaranteed rebirth as a powerful demon after death. He does clarify that these demonic reincarnations appear to be the exception rather than the rule. Still, no proof for these arguments exists one way or another, and most demons enjoy inflicting doubt upon those who pursue this knowledge too closely. Whatever the case, the demonic life cycle is as unpredictable as the abyss, though once again this is detailed more for the Tanari specifically in that future video. Petitioners the most pitiful of chaotic evil mortals come to the abyss in the form of larvae, sickly yellow medium-sized worms with distorted human faces. 
or they manifest in the Shadowfell as soul larvae, according to the lore of 4th edition, where they are then collected or sold by predators like night hags, or collected in the rarer case that a demon lord raids the soul larvae fields. Most demons find market negotiations less dangerous and more lucrative than expeditions to the Shadowfell. Demons often devour these creatures as food, thus destroying them utterly and forever erasing their essence from the multiverse. A demon might promote a larva into a proper demon, such as a quasit, dretch, mains, or rudderkin, by bending the tenuous natural laws of the abyss. Though larvae of exceptionally evil pedigree, such as the soul of a great dictator or violent mastermind, might evolve immediately into a much more powerful and potent demon. The demon lord Alvarez, which I covered in an earlier video, was an example of this. Millennia ago, demons engaged in the Blood War discovered a way to subvert this process, diverting many of the promising souls to the 400th layer of the Abyss, a place called Woeful Escarond. There, a cadre of Nalfeshni, called the Lords of Woe, passed judgment upon the souls, promoting them on the spot to feed the endless appetite of the oldest ongoing conflict in the multiverse, the Blood War. Most petitioners in the Abyss manifest as manes, pale white creatures with oozing sores and bloated, maggot-ridden bellies. Manes vaguely resemble their mortal forms, but the shock of the transformation from mortal to petitioner is overwhelming and the psychic pain is so great that a main remembers little of its original life except that it has lost something precious, and that feeling is enough to drive the creature to violence and madness. The most wicked, and perhaps the luckiest, mains who manage to survive the harsh environs of the abyss often spontaneously evolve into more powerful demons such as rudderkins or dretches. The most powerful of those often ascend to the ranks of demons that are actually considered Tanari, such as Vrox or Succubi. Some of the mightiest demon lords in the Abyss started their afterlife as a lowly petitioner. The souls of those foolish enough to have entered a demonic pact that promised their soul to a demon lord or the chaotic evil worshippers of these demon lords manifest on the home layer of the demon lord when they die, usually as a main. Some demon lords sacrifice a portion of the souls dedicated to them to maintain a hold on their abyssal lair, whereas others press them into service in huge armies that defend their holdings from being preyed on by rival demon lords and their armies. The most chaotic and evil of these creatures eventually evolve into greater Tanari who serve their demonic liege. I say Tanari specifically because Tanari are the demons made of mortal souls, but we'll get to that more in their video. Formation and Promotion Most experts and documents on things demonic agree that demons form out of the raw chaos of the abyss, though after that most diverge in opinion. The Demonomicon, that being the Demonomicon of Igwilv, insists that all demon spawn begin as manes, called larva demons, or other low, lower order fiends, and over the centuries progress up a ladder of power and evil until they become dretches or rudderkins at the whim of a powerful Nalfeshni or demon prince. Once these demon spawn join the hosts of the abyss, they slave away in servitude and fear, hoping to go unnoticed by their masters, for notice means torture and pain while perversely longing for the spark required to transform them into a higher order fiend. Demon spawn loathe their own existence and fear everything around them. A prominent passage from the Demonomicon states, quote, And all this writhes below you, and around you, and your horror makes you part of it. Your putrid flesh corrupted, your ragged soul rent, and your desires bathed in evil and black blood. No demon spawn, you are not forgotten. The terror of existence beyond death is yours. Now writhe and rise forth." End quote. While the Black Scrolls of Om do not refute the Demonomicon's position on the order of demons, Tolkett nor Om disagreed on two important points. First, he wrote that demon spawn could instantly become any level of demon depending on the desires of the Abyss itself. Second, he asserted that the ladder of demon kind is more of a circle, though his picture of the demon hierarchy looks more like a drop of blood than a circle. 
In Om's structure, demon princes exist at the top of the droplet and are, to some extent, out of the circle of existence. Barring a major calamity of uprising, no demon prince needs to fear being demoted and falling back into the reservoir of demons below. Baylors, Meroliths, and other powerful demons stand below the princes and remain somewhat removed from the masses of demons. They possess some individuality and can gain favor with their lords. However, if they become too dangerous or fail in their service, the demon princes or the abyss itself can plunge them back into the general pool. Keep in mind, no one knows whether the Demonomicon or the Black Scrolls speak the truth on this subject, but Tulket nor Om did make one unarguable point. He reasoned that if the Abyss is home to chaos and evil, and demons are an extension or personification of the Abyss, how could they function under a simple structure? Their hierarchy would be based on power, not predictability. The 4th edition Monster Manual 1 shares similar opinions of the demons. There it is said that demons burst forth from the lightless depths of the abyss, live out their short violent lives, and are reabsorbed into the darkness. The first demons were said to be summoned by Theris Dune in his battle against the Oberiths, formed from the burgeoning substance of the abyss itself. No one knows exactly how or why the first demons took form, some sages believe that the fusion of the Shard of Evil and the physical instability inherent in the elemental chaos was the catalyst that spawned demonkind. Others believe that the Shard of Absolute Evil was in fact the aggregate of the wasted souls of much of the Oberith race. When that evil fused with the elemental chaos, a new kind of creature was spawned. Whatever the case, the physiology of the demons is dramatically different from that of any other creature. So all sources seem to agree upon the fact that the first demons, whichever classification they are given, emerged from the very essence of the abyss. Speaking of classification, earlier I mentioned that Advanced D&D 1st Edition referred to demons by numerical type. That trend disappeared for a number of years, but was reintroduced in 5th Edition. Most of the demons listed there are specifically of the Tanari variety, so it's detailed more on the upcoming Tanari video, but to ensure I cover everything I can for this video, here is the ranking of demon types. Type 1, the Barulgura, Shadow Demon, and Vrock. Type 2, the Kazme and Hezru. Type 3, Glabrizu and Yoklo. Type 4, Nalfeshni. Type 5, Merilith. And Type 6, the Baylor and the Garistro. Now for Demonic Ascension in 4th edition. In the unsympathetic regions of the Abyss, demons must adapt or die. New demons are weak and simple. Though a demon can live indefinitely as a minor soulless host, it hungers for power and greatness. To gain power and a higher station in the chaotic hierarchy of the Abyss, a demon must bind and control other demons to its service. Rituals of binding require that a demon consume souls. Many demons choose to purchase souls from the dark creatures that sell them, such as the Night Hags, the Death Giants, which may or may not include the new 5th edition Death Giants, depending on how strict the Raven Queen is with her subjects, and the Oni Spirit Masters, to name a few. Soul energy can also be obtained by slaying creatures with souls, consuming larvae, acquiring demonic parasites or mortal thralls, and possessing a mortal creature and using it to seek and gain power. When it has accumulated enough soul energy, a demon can adopt a new form and more powerful abilities. The more souls a demon consumes, the more attuned it becomes with the abyss and the more control it has over the other denizens of the plane. A demon that consumes significant numbers of souls can also eventually manifest an animus of its own, basically a malevolent will of its own rather than just an extent of the shard of evil. Eventually, soul energy grants a demon enough power to control its own abyssal realm. This full ascension can take anywhere from centuries to uncounted eons, depending on the drive and methods of the individual demon. When this process is complete, a demon can take on a true name and become a demon lord, but that will be covered extensively in the demon lord video. 
Sages and demonologists believe that when a demon slays a living creature, the violence and fury of that act unleashes a residual store of soul energy. It is this energy that a demon absorbs, even as the victim's soul passes to its next stage of existence intact. Unlike demons, immortals also possess souls. The souls of immortals of the Astral Sea are the most prized by demons, and the souls of the Devils of the Nine Hells are those most commonly consumed during the Blood War. As mentioned earlier, demons consume soul larvae, destroying the souls that are trapped within. A single soul larva is worth the equivalent of a thousand gold pieces in goods and services, and soul larvae are the basic currency of the abyss. Demons might sometimes buy or sell soul larvae for coin of equal value, but few demons have need of or reason to use worldly currency. Some demons consume soul larvae right away. Other demons hoard larvae waiting to gorge themselves and thus to gain tremendous boosts of power at strategic times. A lesser demon may resist the temptation to consume a soul larva, instead using it to gain favor from a more powerful demon. Overlords might even demand regular soul larva tribute from servants in exchange for allowing the servants to live. When a demon consumes a soul larva and destroys the soul within, a demon gains a surge of power as the larva shrivels and collapses to dust. In addition to its overall effect on the demon's ascension, which is up to the dungeon master in the long run, consuming a soul larva allows a demon to redo a saving throw or a power recharge roll, kind of like giving them inspiration in 5th edition terms. Alternatively, demons that were elite or solo creatures could consume three soul larvae to regain one action point to use on its turn. Creatures other than demons can consume soul larvae as well. Because this act destroys a soul, albeit a damned one, most good and many unaligned creatures find the idea repugnant. If a non-demon consumes a soul larva, one of the following things can happen. 1. The creature loses a healing surge, a 4th edition ability. 2. The creature gets dazed. 3. The creature is slowed and weakened. 4. The creature emits a foul odor that causes all non-demons adjacent to it to get a negative 2 penalty to attacks, ability checks, and skill checks. Number 5. Their skin turns scaly, rough, or a different color until the end of the encounter. 6. The creature grows horns, a tail, or some other useless demonic appendage, which falls off after the encounter. 7. The creature grows wings and can fly until the end of the encounter. 8. The creature gains temporary hit points equal to its level. 9. A plus 2 bonus to saving throws until the end of the encounter. Or 10. The creature regains a spent encounter power of its choice. So it could have some good effects, it could have some not so good effects. Parasites and Thralls. I mentioned demonic parasites and human thralls earlier very briefly, so let's dive further into that topic now. Demons are notoriously oppressive to their inferiors and regularly devour unwanted servants in a frenzy of bloodlust. However, a lesser demon may temper the destructive desires of a more powerful demon that seeks ascension to a more powerful form by being willing to aid in said ascension. A lesser demon that has neither the ambition nor drive to follow the path of ascension can subordinate itself to a more powerful demon that does. The lesser demon wins a certain amount of security from the wrath of its master in exchange for granting that master a portion of its depraved essence. These sycophantic demons are known as parasites. The amount of their own essence that parasites give up to their masters means that they themselves have little hope of ascension, but the link between parasite and master is not irrevocable, and a master can break the connection out of spite or for its own advantage. A parasite severed from its master takes penalties, which are unspecified and left up to the dungeon master, and rarely survives for long. A similar pact can be entered between a greater demon and a mortal worshipper, known as a thrall. Typically, a thrall is a high-ranking demon cultist or another creature already in service to the abyss. It must choose freely to offer its body, mind, and soul to a demonic master. Demonic progression and ascension via possession of a mortal host will be covered in my video detailing demonic possession, but it is uh, worthwhile just mentioning here. 
Fifth edition is somewhat of a combination of the previous forms of ascension. A demon's status grows with the blood it spills. The more enemies that fall before it, the greater it becomes. A demon might spawn as a mains, then become a dretch, and eventually transform into a vrock after untold time spent fighting and surviving in the abyss. Such elevations are rare, however, for most demons are destroyed before they attain significant power. The greatest of those that do survive make up the ranks of the demon lords that threaten to tear the abyss apart with their endless warring. By expending considerable magical power, demon lords can raise lesser demons into greater forms, though such promotions never stem from a demon's deeds or accomplishments. Rather, a demon lord might warp a mains into a closet when it needs an invisible spy, or turn an army of dretches into hezrus when marching against a rival lord. Demon lords only rarely elevate demons to the highest ranks, fearful of inadvertently creating rivals to their own power. These beings have such power that they can hold sway over entire realms within the abyss. A few demon lords have come to the attention of mortals and are even worshipped as gods in some places, but the vast majority of demon lords remains unknown to scholars and sages. Society the Society of Demons can be explained by this quote from the 4th edition Demonomicon, coming specifically from the pages of the Demonomicon of Igwilf. Quote, As creatures of chaos incarnate, demons have no unified culture. The only modicum of order that exists for a demon is the one imposed upon it by a more powerful demon. And the moment that a demon rises high enough to assert its authority on others is the very moment that rivals begin to subvert that authority. End quote. Fifth edition also says that demons respect power and power alone. A greater demon commands shrieking mobs of lesser demons because it can destroy any lesser demon that dares to refuse its commands. These fiends have no particular affinity for their own kind, which is the biggest reason why they rarely cooperate with one another unless they are forced to submit to a demon lord or an other leader. More so than just that, every demon sees itself as the rightful inheritor of the cosmos. It is driven to destroy all other living creatures, or at least command their absolute loyalty, forcing others around them to serve their purposes. In due time, the laws of the universe will bend to its will, shifting to bring about its vision of a world of absolute perfection with the demon at its center. What specifically motivates a demon varies greatly from one to another and often changes within the same demon, but it is always attached to the fulfillment of its desires. Less intelligent and less powerful demons typically have correspondingly modest visions for what it means to be the center of their universes. All demons have an instinctive sense of their own status and rank, and they typically don't set impossible goals. A lesser demon might simply run amuck when unleashed into the world, its only desire to spread chaos. But a Merolith or other powerful demon usually has an intent that goes beyond the mere carnage, and they often have a plan to achieve it. Demons frequently roam the astral plane and ethereal planes. Their attention is also attracted by persons in an ethereal state. In first edition, there was roughly a 10% chance of encountering a demon within any roaming monster table encountered on the astral plane. Additionally, demons were said to be able to move from their own plane to those of Tartarus, Hades, or Pandemonium. However, they could not enter the material plane without assistance. If the name of a particularly powerful demon is spoken, there is a chance that they will hear and turn their attention towards the speaker, specifically a 5% chance. The demon will thereupon immediately kill, by whatever means are most expeditious, the one pronouncing its name, unless the speaker is prepared to avoid such attention or to control the demon. It's not specified if this is the demon's common name or its true name that this, is, this passage is referring to, but just be wary if you say the name of some specific demon, or make sure not to start speaking from a book of true names openly. According to Advanced D&D 1st Edition, when demons of type 1 through 6 are encountered within a lair, there's a 75% chance that there will be 1 to 6 of the exact same type, uh, 1 through 6, of the demon, and there's a 25% chance that it would be a mixed variety of types, 1 through 6. Death. 
What happens to demons when they die is another cause of much debate. Advanced D&D 1st Edition says that only powerful demons, type 5 and above specifically, are not actually slain when their material form is killed in combat. With no form to call their own, they are sent back to their plane and remain there for one century or until aided by another to leave their plane. However, if demons are encountered on their own plane, they can be slain. No demons can ever be subdued. Second edition, Faces of Evil the Fiends, says despite the demon's tough attitude that keeps them from coming back even when they are badly hurt, they can be slain. Sometimes, though, a demon reforms back in the abyss. It all depends on where it dies, what kind of demon it is, and what measures the slayer takes to prevent the resurrection. If a demon dies while it is in the abyss, it is dead forever. The corpse is sucked back into the abyss and eventually spit out in the form of a manes or such lesser creature, just based on the demonic essence itself returning to the abyss and reforming as a different creature. It is too close to the source of its power, too close to reform and try again. The pull of the abyss is just too strong. If the fiend's spirit is somehow destroyed as well, the corpse just withers away and does not feed the abyss. This is possibly because demons aren't dual-natured creatures. Their souls and bodies form one complete unit, not two separate things. Demons find it easier to remake themselves when they are killed while away from their home plane. Their spirits just fly back to the abyss and are reborn. But not all demons can do this. Least, lesser, and even greater Tanari have not developed enough of a link to the abyss to find their way back there. Tanari were listed specifically because this was 2nd edition and the terms were used interchangeably in this source book, but it seems based on other editions and other sources that this would refer to demons in general, so I'm just leaving it in this video. Besides, least, lesser, and even greater Tanari don't have enough willpower to reform even if they did make it. If they die out of the abyss, they are written in the dead book and that's it. Only true Tanari, as in the ranking of Tanari, again we'll talk about this in the, uh, the video on them, have the link and force of will. Over the centuries they have learned to master their forms and the fires that burn within. Some of the most learned of the Sladi say the true Tanari carry pieces of the abyss in their hearts when they travel, and the plane calls that fragment back when the shell falters. Still, the process of rebirth takes time, a hundred years or so. The white-hot anger of the dead Tanari must reshape its individual form out of the churning mass and hatred that is the abyss. The dead demon must hold on to its desire for life this whole time, for if it falters, it is lost forever. But most demons succeed, struggling to the very last. And depending on a fiend's strength of will, it can potentially be reborn into a higher or lower position on the power chain. There are some who claim that if a Tanari dies, any Tanari, it reforms on the abyss at the lowest of the low, returning to life as a mains. This is also said to be untrue. There are numerous accounts of demons dying on other planes only to be reborn in their own form within the abyss. In 3.5e, both the Black Scrolls of Om and the Demonomicon acknowledge the following basic concepts. Outside of the abyss, if a demon is killed on another plane, its body eventually returns to the abyss unless trapped through magical means, such as a dimensional anchor spell. No matter what happens to the demon's body, if it is killed outside the abyss, its essence falls back into the raw chaos of the abyss, where it is then reformed as a new demon. It is unclear whether these reincarnated demons begin again at the bottom of the abyssal hierarchy, or if they are just demoted, but everyone seems certain that death can only be seen as a failure for a demon, so it is unlikely to avoid punishment altogether. So when a demon dies on another plane, it risks falling back into the general pool of demon spawn and can find itself demoted in power and essence, which is not to be taken lightly. For example, a Vrock sent to wreak havoc on the material plane faces a very real danger if it fails in its mission. If it is defeated and sent shrieking back to the abyss, it can find itself in the body of a dretch, a rudderkin, or even a main. Even Baylors risk this eternal cycle when they battle for their abyssal lords. Only the direct intervention of a demon prince can possibly spare this punishment. 
though as mentioned earlier, Baylors and Merilis and other higher-ranking demons can potentially avoid falling down the ranks. Though again, this is a little iffy as there are certain cases where a demon has been shown to just keep the same ranking, but whatever, we'll just leave it as it is. The 5th edition monster manual has it stated that a demon which is slain outside of the abyss dissolves into a foul ichor and instantly reforms in the abyss, mind and essence intact, which implies that a demon keeps its form and rank. In the beginning anyways, who's to say what a demon lord may do to a demon that fails? The important exception to all this occurs when a demon is summoned out of the abyss magically, in which case it simply returns unharmed when the spell ends or when the demon is destroyed, no matter what happens to it in the meantime. Thus, demons summoned to the material plane have little fear of death. Back to 3.5e for a second. Within the abyss, if a demon is killed while within the abyss, it is permanently destroyed both its body and its essence. For this reason, many demons are relatively more cautious on their home turf than when wreaking havoc on another plane. While a demotion through reincarnation is not ideal, most demons view it as a much better option than complete annihilation. Fifth edition says the same thing, stating that the only way to truly destroy a demon is to seek it out in the abyss and end it there. However, a powerful demon can take steps to protect its life essence, even while in the abyss, using a secret method and abyssal metals to create an amulet which a portion of the demon's essence is transferred into. If the demon's abyssal form is ever destroyed, the amulet allows the fiend to reform at a time and place of its choosing, kind of like a stronger version of a lich's phylactery. Obtaining a demonic amulet is a dangerous pursuit, and simply seeking such a device risks drawing the attention of the demon lord that created it. A creature possessing a demonic amulet can exact favors from the demon whose life essence the amulet holds, or inflict great pain onto the demon if they resist. If an amulet is destroyed, the demon that created it is trapped in the abyss for a year and a day. Earlier editions also had mention of demonic amulets, but they were exclusively for demon princes and demon lords, so I'll be talking about those more in the demon lord video. Whereas this one here in, from 5th edition, it, while it mentions demon lords, it does mention generically demons throughout the passage. Demonic Death Throws Demons outside of the abyss don't die calmly. When a Baylor dies, it explodes in a blinding flash of light and flame that consumes its body and sends whatever soul it possesses shrieking back to the abyss. Not many lesser demons die as spectacularly, but they don't usually just fall to the earth and rot either, as mentioned earlier. Fiendish Codex 1 Hordes of the Abyss provides the following table of suggestions of what might occur when a demon dies outside of the abyss. I'll show the list, but rather than saying each one, I'll list my top three of the following. Number one, the demon's corpse explodes into tiny, one-inch high duplicates of itself. The tiny demons immediately begin fighting amongst themselves until only one remains, which then vanishes in a puff of smoke. Number two, two snakes force their way out of the killing wound and begin to devour the corpse from either end. If attacked, the snakes and the remains disappear. And my third favorite, the classic, the demon corpse melts into a pool of black tar-like ichor. One excerpt from the Battle of Darkspur, as related in the Black Scrolls of Om, describes the following, quote, And as the mirrorless head fell from its shoulders, blood burbled forth. Tiny grubs swam in the gore, and as we watched, they consumed the demon's body and attempted to crawl away to freedom. Revolted, we threw the stone table onto the corpse, hoping to squash the foul creatures. Later, when we cleared away the broken stone, we found only the demon's swords and a splattering of black and red blood. The larvae were gone. End quote. So, any way that a demon dies, a majority of the time it is a spe spectacular fashion that is far different from any other creature. Aging. As for the rest of the demonic life cycle, demons don't grow old and they do not die of anything remotely resembling natural causes. At best, they return to the unformed abyss, and their essence becomes part of the plane's evil and chaos. At worst, well, no one can really say. 
Fourth edition also has demonic death throws, which are detailed in the Demonomicon. When a demon is dropped to zero hit points, a death throw power can activate. While some demons have predetermined death effects, those that don't could potentially have one of the following generic types. And demons that have death throws normally can swap that one out for one of these. Also, demon possessed creatures can have a death throw when not on the abyss. Firstly is Death Rattle, a death cry that can overwhelm creatures close by, effectively making them dazed and dealing thunder damage. Death Vortex, the, the demon's body twists and tears in a vicious whirlwind, pulling creatures closer and dealing necrotic damage. Demon Inside is a weird one. The demon's animus manifests as a lesser version of itself, leaping out of the dead demon's remains. This minion lasts until the fallen demon's next turn. Dissolving Vapors makes the demon dissolve into a cloud of noxious vapors upon death which deals acid damage. Final Spew liquefies a demon's organs into a blast of toxin that deals poison damage and blinds unfortunate creatures nearby. Finally, Unstable Ice. The demon freezes within a pillar of ice that can explode into deadly shards, causing piercing damage, cold damage, pushes the targets, and turns the area into difficult terrain. And all of those examples just happen when a demon dies. Demons of 3rd edition were considered outsiders. An outsider is at least partially composed of the essence, but not necessarily the material, of some plane other than the material plane, in this case the abyss. Some creatures start out as some other types and become outsiders when they attain a higher or lower spiritual existence, such as how the abyssal petitioners that are sometimes turned into Tanari were once living mortals. Unlike most other living creatures, an outsider does not have a dual nature, as I mentioned earlier, so I'm going to expand here. Its soul and its body form one unit. When an outsider is slain, no soul is, let, is set loose. Spells that restore souls to their bodies, such as Raise Dead, Reincarnate, and Resurrection, do not work on an outsider. It takes a different magical effect, such as Limited Wish, Wish, Miracle, or True Resurrection to restore it to life. However, an outsider with the native subtype can be raised, reincarnated, or resurrected just as other living creatures can be. But most demons do not have this native subtype. These, these are creatures with ancestors from the material plane or a stronger connection to them, like the ASMR or tieflings. Related to this is body, soul, and animus. According to 4th edition, Oberiths and transformed primordials are among the few types of demons possessing souls, due specifically to the origin of the Oberiths and demon lords in 4th edition. As are other creatures that metamorphose into demons through force of will or through exposure to the abyss. Lesser demons form souls through experience, through servitude to demons with souls, or through consumption of soul larvae. Demons with souls can typically reason, connive, and plan more subtly than soulless demons. Demonic souls do not belong to the cycle connecting the Astral Sea, the Shadowfell, and the afterlife of mortal creatures. Again, 4th edition and specifically mortal creatures. Demonic souls feed only on destruction and death. Some sages and demonologists, including Igwil, refer to the demonic soul-like energy as an animus, extending from the shard of evil at the heart of the abyss. This really has no standing with other editions. It's more specifically 4th edition in terms of this, because in other editions it specifically mentions Tanari having souls as they came from humans, but it's just an interesting thing I thought I'd throw in. Demons that have souls do what they can to avoid death, knowing that their plots and personal power will dissipate with their own destruction. Even the dimmest demons, though, realize that the Abyss's goal of ultimate destruction includes them. True Names Though demons all have common names, every demon lord and every demon of type 1 through 6 has a true name that it keeps secret. A demon can be forced to disclose its true name if charmed, and ancient scrolls and tomes are said to exist that list the true names of the most powerful demons. A mortal who learns a demon's true name can use powerful summoning magic to call the demon from the abyss and exercise some measure of control over it. However, most demons brought to the material plane in this manner do everything in their power to wreak havoc or sow discord and strife. There is a lot 
there is actually a lot of information on the subject of true names so that will be its own video just true names in general but there's a bit more to true names for demons that I will mention in uh, other videos specifically the demon lord video as I mentioned earlier demons on the material plane most demons will remain prisoners of the abyss for eternity. In addition to the innate horrors of the abyss itself, most demons are enslaved and tormented by more powerful demons. The only relief they have is the suffering of other lesser demons or visitors to the abyss, whom they can fight or torment, unless they find a way out. Few demons have the ability to plane shift away from the abyss, and those that do, ironically, have the least reason to venture outside of their domains. They are the powers on their layers, ruling other demons. Unless they feel the abyss's call to bring chaos to another plane, these demons concentrate on maintaining power against their rivals, not traveling across the cosmos looking for trouble. Unfortunately for everyone else, the Abyss does hunger to corrupt other planes and grow beyond its planar borders. Many demons without the power to move themselves onto other planes will heed the call of creatures seeking demonic aid in their unholy endeavors. Getting to the Material Plane Even for those demons unable to transport themselves out of the Abyss, opportunities to wreak demonic havoc on the Material Plane do exist. Each has its own limitations, of course, but demons seize any opportunity for evil and corruption in both talons, and then they squeeze. Few acts are as dangerous as summoning a demon, and even mages who bargain freely with devils fear the fiends of the abyss. Demons can be summoned by creatures slash characters of any alignment, but controlling a demon is another matter entirely. In 1st edition, a Thaumaturgic Circle would serve to keep out demons of types 1 through 5, and a special pentacle is required for demon type 6 or greater. The threat or reward which the conjuring party uses to attempt gaining a demon's service must be carefully handled by the dungeon master in most cases. Demons are repelled by holy or good relics or artifacts, according to the Advanced D&D 1st Edition Monster Manual. A warlock traces mysterious patterns into a stone floor, eldritch energy feeding into each symbol to create a dangerous trap. Deep in the forest, cultists gather under a full moon at a blood-stained altar, chanting litanies whose power can unlock the barriers between the planes. A legendary wizard is found dead in his laboratory. His grisly remains a testament to a failed ritual of demon summoning. The Call Some demons and rituals can call demons to the material plane. Powerful spellcasters can use the gate spell to wrench a demon out of the abyss and onto the material plane, giving them no chance to resist. A gate spell often helps the caster control a demon while it remains outside the abyss, but fiends practice deception and betrayal as part of life and demons are no exception. An overly ambitious or uncautious spellcaster could quickly find a gated demon outside of their control, and with no chance to respond, it could result in a demon on the loose. Lesser spellcasters, most often demonic cultists, rely on complex rituals, fiendish artifacts, and living sapient sacrifices to call demons to their service. These casters normally don't possess the strength to control the demons they call forth, but most fiends play along with those that allow them to access the material plane. As long as these fools ask a demon to do things it wants to do anyways, it serves. Once the demon grows bored, however, it begins to find ways to act independently and betray its master. Those capable of performing the summon demon ritual divulge the details of the ritual to others only with great caution. The reasons for the control of information varies from summoner to summoner. Some are secretive to guard access to their demon masters. Others control the spread of information to prevent it from falling into the hands of evil creatures, or even just those more evil than themselves. The power of the ritual lies not only in its intent, but in its ease. Beyond the crafting of its focus, the ritual requires little more than the desire to tap into the power of the abyss. However, ritual casters that do not fully understand that power are destroyed by it more often than not. A demon might react to a summons in any number of ways. 
Some demons take pleasure in being summoned, treating it as an opportunity to gain access to the world and perhaps poison a few mortal minds. A demon can also learn information from the bargain the summoner strikes with it, hoping that such information might be useful to its own abyssal masters. A demon weaker than the summoner might exhibit an eagerness to please. A more powerful demon might resent even a small fragment of its awareness being called away by another's power, treating the summoner as an enemy from the start. Most often, they show no gratitude when brought to the material plane, raging against their prisons and demanding release. Those who would risk summoning a demon might do so to wrest information from it, press it into service, or send it on a mission that only a creature of absolute evil can complete. Preparation is key, and experienced summoners know the specific spells and magic items that can force a demon to bend to another's will. If a single mistake is made, a demon that breaks free shows no mercy as it makes its summoner the first victim of its wrath. Demons are not easily bent to the will of their summoners. When a demon appears in the midst of combat, it is with the boundless fury and power of an elemental. 4th edition claims that personal power, wealth, prestige, and even survival are not important to demons. Their only goal is to destroy as much as they can before they themselves are destroyed. And then, born anew in the depths of the abyss, they rise again to continue the destruction. Calling versus Summoning There is a difference between calling a fiend and summoning one. A summon monster spell can temporarily draw a demon out of the abyss and force it into service, but it takes a calling effect, such as the gate spell, to give a demon a permanent presence on another plane. When the duration of a summon monster or similar spell elapses, the creature returns to the abyss unharmed, despite any efforts or actions taken by it or the spellcaster. A dispel magic or similar spell can also send a summoned creature back prematurely. A spell or ritual calling a demon forth brings the creature to the plane indefinitely. Only a more powerful spell such as banishment can send an abyssal fiend back to the abyss. Demon lords are rarely summoned for fear of enraging them, but even the most powerful demon lord might temper its fury with curiosity as it faces the mortal with hubris enough to bargain with it. This behavior is short-lived, however, much like those who anger a demon lord. For demon lords have been known to spend any number of mortal lifetimes tracking down and destroying creatures that dare to use the summon demon ritual against them. However, summoning the demon or calling the demon is only the first step for the most ambitious of summoners. Next there is the binding, detailed in 4th edition. A creature that seeks to bind a demon to its service can approach this dangerous task in one of two ways. A powerful spellcaster can use brute force, compelling the demon to serve with threats of punishment or destruction. Creatures lacking such talents must instead entice a demon into service typically with sacrifices and promises of fealty to the demon's own master. Regardless of which path is taken, demon and summoner are inexorably linked by the process that calls the demon forth. A demon's fundamental nature changes in response to that link, creating a bond that the summoner can use to its advantage. As of 4th edition, the binding of a demon gives it a new ability created by the Pact of Demonic Binding, which represents the link between the demon and its new master. The new power is a sign of the bond between a demon and whatever spellcaster, high priest, or champion of the abyss that it is bound to. A master can have more than one bound demon, but a bound demon can only have one master. A bound demon appears in whichever world at the behest of a mortal creature, typically in response to a sacrifice or other reward. The greater the sacrifice offered, the more powerful the demon that can be bound to service. Alternatively, a demon lord might compel a servant to swear loyalty to a faithful mortal follower for the lord's own ends. So just an example of that, a high cultist is uh, serving a demon lord's uh, means on the material plane, but needs assistance, so the demon lord might lend that cultist a Merilith uh, until the completion of the task. The abilities can be found in the 4th edition Demonomicon, yet I'll give you some examples of good abilities that bind these two creatures. Blood Oath. 
This power can be used when the master takes damage, transferring all damage to the demon instead, though the demon retains control over when the power can be used. Bond of Absolute Obedience. This power is often forced onto demons by spellcasters to prevent betrayal. This makes it so the bound creature's attacks, auras, and other powers have no effect on its master unless the master chooses to allow it. And Bond of Vengeance. Given to demons bound to masters who are important to their demon lord, such as a high-level cult leader, if an enemy's attack reduces the creature's master to zero hit points, the demon gains a plus four bonus on attack rolls against that enemy until the end of the encounter. So this is, again, like it says, a bond of vengeance. The bound demons are not the only ones that can benefit from the binding. Just as a demon gains additional powers when bound to a mortal's service, its master can benefit from unique boons granted by the control of the demonic servant. Such powers are mastered by demonologists who specialize in rituals of binding, or by high priests and other powerful individuals in the service of a demon lord. Some of my favorites are Instant Summons, which is a minor action taken by the master which teleports a bound creature within 10 squares or 50 feet of the master to within 2 squares of the master. So basically it's a short form teleportation from somewhere nearby to even closer. Or Replenishing Banishment, which allows a master to end the bond of servitude to replenish themselves with that power, effectively allowing them to banish a servant demon, which just got bloodied, back to the abyss and gain temporary hit points. 5th edition has a different take on binding, less like binding a demon to one's service and more like restraining it. The Book of Vile Darkness, the Black Scrolls of Om, and the Demonomicon of Igwilv are the foremost authorities on demonic matters. These ancient tomes describe techniques that can trap the essence of a demon on the material plane, placing it within a weapon, idol, or piece of jewelry, and preventing the fiend's return to the abyss. An object that binds a demon must be specially prepared with unholy incantations and innocent blood. It radiates a palpable evil, chilling and fouling the air around it. A creature that handles such an object experiences unsettling dreams and wicked impulses, but is able to control the demon whose essence is trapped within the object. Destroying the object frees the demon, which immediately seeks revenge against its binder. Demons are also capable of bestowing demonic boons. Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes from 5th edition has a few examples. Boons can be bestowed by demons of sufficient cunning and power who seek to use the recipients as pawns in their schemes. Typical demons can only bestow a number of boons equal to their hit dice. Boons from demons are fickle gifts that remain only so long as the demon is pleased. Accepting such a boon is a damning act that corrupts the soul and drives a person towards acts of chaos and madness. Yet rejecting a boon is likely to provoke a demon's wrath. It is a risky endeavor dealing with demons. Some example boons are a fiery soul bestowed by a Baylor, which gives a creature resistance to fire damage and causes them to explode when slain. A Garistro can give a creature a labyrinth recall, allowing them to perfectly recall any path it has traveled, and others which I will mention in the videos for the respective demons. Fiendish Portals Wherever they wander across the abyss, demons search for portals to other planes. They crave the chance to slip free of their native realm, and spread their dark influence across the multiverse, undoing the works of the gods, tearing down civilizations, and reducing the entire cosmos to despair and ruin. Some of the darkest legends of the mortal realm are built around the destruction wrought by demons set loose on the worlds. The threat presented by the demons causes even nations embroiled in bitter conflicts to set aside their differences to combat an outbreak or to seal off abyssal breaches before the chaotic fiends can break free. Portals and leaks between the planes exist all over the universe. Sometimes the abyss opens a portal between itself and another plane, often the material plane, that allows abyssal denizens to escape. These escaped demons immediately begin looking for areas they can haunt and creatures they can terrorize and kill. Usually these portals open in places that have seen great evil, destruction, or cataclysms, natural or magical. 
or even in secluded hidden areas where evil can grow and thrive such as the following underground caverns torture chambers sites of human slash sapient sacrifice battlefields mountain caves disturbed by avalanche fissures opened by earthquakes active volcanoes abandoned villages or large dwellings deep forests or tombs the use of evil artifacts, the performance of gruesome sacrifices, and the destruction of nearby good and lawful elements all play into the Abyss's strategy. Wherever evil exists, the Abyss finds it and sends out its creatures. Once through a fiendish portal, demons and other creatures do what they can to bring forth more elements of the Abyss. Abyssal portals often close behind these exploratory forces, which means they must perform certain tasks to reopen the portal. Fortunately for any adventurers eager to dispel these creatures, fiendish portals on the material plane have tenuous connections with the abyss at best. Often, banishing or killing the demons that have already passed through the portal can break the connection and close the portal. Sanctifying the area can help keep the portal from reforming. Unfortunately, the demons fighting to reopen the portal or keep it open often take steps to avoid the closure of the portal. Many attract mortals in search of power to aid them in their rituals, which only strengthens the chaos and evil of the area. Some build powerful keys in the form of magic items and use them to lock the portal open. Only by finding and destroying the keys can the doorway be closed. Characteristics of Demonic Presence Demons carry the stain of abyssal corruption with them, and their mere presence changes the world for the worse. The Abyss and its demonic inhabitants are like a virus. While most other factions across the plains spread their influence into other realms through means such as conquest, conversion, or diplomacy, demons infect a world by traveling there and transforming their new environment to resemble the malleable, chaotic substance of their home plane. If demons stay in a place for a significant amount of time, the area starts to warp in response to the abyssal energy that churns within it. If a demonic infestation is left unchecked, a portal to the abyss is the inevitable outcome, and more and more of the essence of the abyss pushes its way through. In time, a plane or world could become a colony of the abyss, overrun with demons and devoid of all other forms of life. Initial Infection a full-fledged demonic incursion takes time to develop. Even if a demon prince rampages across a world for a few days or weeks before returning home, that doesn't qualify as an incursion. After the demon is banished, the world suffers no long-term effects aside for the destruction done by said demon. But if demons can dwell undisturbed on a plane for a period of time, their continued presence begins to erode the barriers between their location and the abyss. It can take anywhere from a few years for weaker demons to merely about a month for a demon prince to warp the environment around them. To bring about these changes, the invaders must remain in the same location for some time, usually in an area no more than six miles on a side. Fortunately for would-be victims, the chaotic nature of demons means that they rarely organize a way to cause such a disturbance. Demons that enter the world are bent on destruction rather than the greater picture, and are inclined to go their separate ways unless a powerful leader can hold them under control long enough for the virus to take hold. During the first stages of an abyssal incursion, the natural world recoils from the demonic presence. While demons are brutal and direct, they can act subtly when required, so spotting a demonic portal or an area corrupted by demons isn't always easy. Areas touched by the abyss might show the following characteristics, but not always. Organic foul structures, walls and floors made of hardened flesh. Hauntings by chaotic evil spirits, souls brought or captured by the demons. Illogical or impossible features, insides of buildings larger than outside, labyrinthine mazes. Inexplicable weather or other seemingly natural disturbances, snow in summer, earthquakes in areas not known for such disturbances. Bodies of water in the area become tainted and sometimes poisonous, and the weather might feature extreme heat, cold, wind, rain, or snow that aren't typical of the normal climate. Blood and gore found where no deaths have occurred, uh, filling a well or oozing down walls. Animals or crops dying for no reason. 
Plants become twisted versions of themselves, leering faces appear in leaf patterns, vines writhe of their own accord, and trees grow foul-smelling tumors instead of leaves as their branches wither and die. Magic items functioning strangely, wands exhibiting unusual displays such as a wand of magic missiles that fires sickly green bolts instead of normal bolts of brilliant blue energy. Lawful and good creatures feeling paranoid, distracted, or even inexplicably ill. Chaotic and evil creatures drawn to the area, some at the behest of demons, others just in response to the evil and chaos. Natural animals turning aggressive or violent, possibly even changing into dire versions. Animals may shun the locations where a demon has made a kill. The sight of demonic infestation may be marred by a stench that never diminishes, and permanent shadows can mark the places where these fiends lingered. And those are a number of examples among potentially hundreds of others. A growing menace. If the first stages of the infection continues long enough, a portal opens within the corrupted environments that connect to a random location in the abyss. Demons that happen to be near a portal can travel through it and into the world, while the raw stuff of the abyss also begins to seep through. Yet even at this stage, the infection has almost no chance of developing into a true incursion. The immensity of the abyss means that a portal's random location is more likely to be an empty, uninhabited place than anything else, and demons can't make use of a portal unless they can locate it. If this is the case, the incursion might be long delayed, but the portal's opening on the other plane remains a lurking threat until it is closed. As more demons find and use the portal, the abyss becomes strongly linked to the connected world, and the region's transformations grow more extreme. The odd but still mundane weather effects give way to storms that drop burning embers or winds that shriek in all directions, seizing living creatures and hurling them against the ground. The environment becomes inimical to all living things. At this point, the incursion is still in a state of flux. Demons aren't yet directed by a single will. Unless a powerful demon dominates all the others, the area is racked by fighting as one demon after another claims primacy only to be overcome. The link to the abyss is still fragile enough that, as demons are slain, the portal grows smaller and weaker. If the invaders are reduced to about half the numbers that were present when the portal was created, the opening winks out of existence. Stains of Reality In its third phase, the demonic virus invades fully and becomes part of the world. Simply destroying the demons in an afflicted area is no longer enough to remove the stain of the abyss. The size of the region begins to grow, the effects of the lethal environment expanding from the original area. The demons likewise begin to roam, and a small force capable of establishing its own incursion might travel far. If enough of these groups splinter off, the incursion could spread to a network of similar sites, each opening its own portal and drawing in more demons. Slaying all the demons in an infested area closes their direct threat, but the terrain remains twisted and accursed, the portal dormant but still in place. To repel the incursion at this stage, the defenders must not only slay the demons but also establish a permanent watch over the portal to ensure that it remains unused. Ambitious cultists or even a random gathering of planar energy could awaken the portal and restart the infection. Apocalypse Now. If the incursion remains unchecked or grows strong enough, it enters its fourth and final phase with the entrance of a demon lord. As a portal continues to redirect demons and abyssal energies into the world, it begins to attract the attention of the lords. Two or more of them might fight for control of it, or in the worst case, several might travel through the portal in rapid succession. The visitation of a demon lord to the material plane is a cataclysmic event. The lord's presence overwhelms the minds of other beings to keep them from resisting, and the lord's power enables it to command the other demons already present in the world. They form a horrid army that sets about stripping the world of life and clearing the path for the lord's dominance. At this point, a besieged world's only hope for survival is the banishment of the demon lord. The Lord's defeat leaves the other demons again leaderless. 
and they react by warring against each other, which makes them susceptible to attacks from the world's defenders. The longer a demon lord remains in control of all the other fiends, the more the world around it becomes irrevocably changed. When a demonic incursion runs its course, no vestige remains of the world that existed before. In effect, the realm has become another layer of the abyss. 3.5e's Fiendish Codex 1, Hordes of the Abyss, provides us with six truths about demons. Number one, demons are very intelligent, with few exceptions, the dretch being the foremost example. Most demons have above average intelligence and wisdom scores, not to mention impressive charisma scores. Number two, demons have more abilities than they need. Most fiends have more supernatural and special abilities than they will use in a typical combat many of which are at will. For example, a Merolith from 3.5e will every so often cast magic weapon on its longswords to be prepared for a later combat, so they won't use it during combat. 3. Where there's one demon, there's usually more. Demons are chaotic and selfish, but they do have social skills. Sort of. A lone demon on the material plane can always attempt to summon help from home. Demons, particularly non-Tanari, that can't summon other fiends are usually more pack-oriented or work with non-demons. Yes, a lone Quasit might wander a dungeon looking for trouble, but it probably knows where to run if adventurers catch it at its mischief. 4. For demons, running away is not only smart, it can also be fun. Demons love bloodshed, but they also revel in pain and suffering. Fiends often have many ways of escaping encounters that become too dangerous. It's a wonder some demons even have feet, what with their greater teleport ability. On occasion, fiends can also see greater profit, or at least more amusement, in leaving a fight while the outcome is still in doubt, but usually they will return. 5. Demons are odd job specialists. Few demons are one-trick ponies. Nearly all have a variety of skills and enough evil cunning to allow them to exploit any situation to their advantage. A demon could be an unreliable servant, a disloyal henchman, or a whim-driven master, sometimes at the same time. Number 6. The Abyss Calls to Them First and foremost, demons exist to spread chaos and evil, the nature of the abyss. If demons expect to be on the material plane for long, they will often either find or create places similar to their chaotic homes. Abyssal fiends like to open portals to the abyss not just for reinforcements, but to expand the influence of chaos and evil throughout the plains. In original Dungeons & Dragons Eldritch Wizardry, some common abilities of the demons were infravision, the ability to teleport with no chance of error, cause darkness with varying degrees of effectiveness depending on the demon, and the ability to open a gate with varying uh, chances of success according to the type of the demon. Common abilities in Advanced D&D 1st Edition were as follows. Types 1 through 3 demons are affected by non-magical weapons. Types 4 and greater were not affected by non-magical weapons. The same infravision, darkness, and teleportation as uh, original D&D. They take full damage from acid, iron weapons, magic missile, and poison. Half damage from cold, electricity, magic, and dragonfire, and poisonous gas. Silver weapons only hurt demons the same as non-magical weapons. They weren't the same as devils. Cold iron weapons were for demons, silver was for devils. Second edition spoke specifically of the Tanari, so those traits will be covered in the Tanari video. All demons were classified as outsiders in third edition. The traits granted to them because of being outsiders include a 60 foot range of dark vision, and many of them were able to create darkness. All demons of 3rd edition were able to speak Abyssal, Celestial, and Draconic, unless otherwise noted, in the individual creature's description. 4th edition demons were too varied to have any general traits. Vision, resistances, and immunities completely varied from demon to demon. Some demons even had what was known as variable resistance, allowing them to become resistant to a choice damage type a limited number of times per encounter. 
Fifth edition demons have some consistency in characteristics, such as most of them having resistance to cold, fire, and lightning damage, immunity to poison, what doesn't, and dark vision, uh, though again, what doesn't have dark vision in fifth edition. And many of fifth edition's demons have telepathy, not all of them, but quite a few. Some demons throughout the editions have the ability to summon other demons, commonly once per day, and depending on the summoner, the percentage of success was different. Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes for 5th edition also has some interesting charts for personality traits, ideals, bonds, flaws, and unusual features for demons. Listing them here would be redundant, as they are just specific examples of what I've already covered lore-wise generally, but if you wanted anything uh, specific, like just small little snippets of traits and ideals for your own demons, I'm just letting you know. In combat, demons enjoy combat. They are ferocity personified and will attack any creature, other demons included, just because they find it fun. They enjoy terrifying their victims before slaying them and often devour the slain. Those with spell-like abilities often use them from a distance. A group of demons frequently blanket any enemies with darkness before joining battle. These combat tactics were more specific to 3rd edition, but not many other editions had specific combat tactics for demons generally. They'd have combat tactics for individual ones, but I'll cover those in each individual video. In a campaign, demons cover all levels of play. Since they are a threat against the very structure of the cosmos, demons are easy to fit into epic level tiers as world-destroying threats, the strongest of them allowing you to incorporate a variety of deities, primordials, and other mighty beings. Or in other levels of play, demons can be the uh, minions of villains, leaders of armies, or standalone creatures. Demons are tough, strange, and varied enemies that have such a range of power that they can fit in any situation or level. And there we have it. That is all the generic demon lore summarized, organized, and detailed. This is the majority of the information on demons, but of course, as I mentioned at the beginning, there is other lore that pertains more to the demon subtypes that can still be considered major information when it comes to demon kind. So be prepared for those videos, and uh, I hope you watch them. Anyways, if you've enjoyed the video, please leave a like and subscribe to help support the channel. More videos will be coming soon. Thank you all so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.